flames of fire destroy your dreams. The Lord will restore all that was lost. A member of the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame, he has one of the most recognizable voices around the world. Keith Bilbrey was the announcer of the world famous Grand Old Opry for 35 years and is loved by many who have graced the stage. When his historic Nashville home in which he and his wife, Emmy Jo, lived burned to the ground, the common question among those who loved him was, how can we help Keith? God had a plan to restore what had been lost. Today, his voice can be heard on television shows like Huckabee and Larry's Country Diner. This is their story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Keith and Emmy Jo Bilbrey, I am so honored to sit down and spend this time with you. Normally, we're in your home, but today we're in a barn next to your home. This is your home and it's no longer there or part of it. We're gonna talk about that, but before, I wanna to talk to Keith and you, and Keith, you have been the voice of the Grand Old Opry for over 35 years. Well, I was, till a few years ago. <laughs> well, can you give me your voice there? Oh, uh... Like, introduce the sure, show. Sure, presenting the Grand Old Opry. Let her go, boys. I am so excited to sit down. What was it like to be the voice of the Grand Old Opry? First time terrifying. <laughs> I, had, I had been a fan of the Opry since I was a kid. My dad listened to it every Saturday night, and I, I just dreamed, I don't know why, but I just dreamed of being there someday. When I was 12 years old, uh, some friends came in to town, and we took them to the Grand Ole Opry. Are you First from time. Nashville? I'm from Cookville, which is okay, yeah. about 100 miles east. And uh, we all went to the Grand Ole Opry. I can tell you the exact place I sat at the Ryman Auditorium. Grant Turner. Now, Grant Turner was the voice of the Grand Ole Opry, undoubtedly. He, uh, he had been my hero. I had listened to him a million times. I knew exactly what he looked like although I'd never laid eyes on him. The show starts, I'm up in the balcony looking down, I'm finally gonna get to see Grant Turner. I didn't care who was singing, I wanted to see Grant Turner. And the curtain goes up and there's Grant Turner talking about Martha White Biscuits and it's like, who is that guy? <laughs> and I ran downstairs and I'm standing at the base of the podium looking up. It's not at all like I thought he would look like, you know? You have this, you know, radio's been called the theater of the mind and you have, exactly what these people look like in your mind. And he, he didn't look anything like that. But uh, long story short, uh, Grant and I became dear friends. He was one of my great mentors. He helped me in so many ways when I started announcing and just became a dear friend. And uh, he, he was the inspiration for me wanting to be a, a, a Grand Ole Opry announcer. Well, how did you get started? Well, I, I was... Uh, Actually, I, I had a job when I was 15 at the local radio station in Cookville, uh, WHUB. Listened to it all my life. I wanted to be there. And uh, I was at the interview. I had the job. The manager was talking to me. And he's looking there. He said, Keith, you're 15 years old. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'm sorry, but the child labor laws will not let me work you <laughs> the hours I need to work till you're 16. I was crushed. Absolutely crushed. He said, now you come back and see me when you turn 16. I left there. Uh, in fact, the secretary told me years later, as I, she said, I had never seen a kid so deflated in my life. You were just like, this is the end of the world. I'll, I'll never be in radio. I actually went on, up on the square in Cookville. My, uh, uh, Keith Crawford was an attorney there. He's the guy I was named for. I called him Uncle Keith. And I went into his office and I told the secretary, I need to see Uncle Keith now. And she got on the, on the intercom. She said, uh, Mr. Crawford, Keith Spilbury's out here. Needs to, he really needs to see you. And I went in. I said, is there anything we can do, Uncle Keith? He said, no, it's a federal law. You, you can't do anything with it. So the minute I turned 16, I went back. 
and I got the job. <laughs> so I started when I was 16 and was still in high school. I was a big deal in high school because I played rock and roll records on the radio at night. How did you get to the Grand Old Opry? Well, I'd been working on that since the beginning, put in several applications. Anything they had, I would have swept floors. I, didn't, I wanted to get to WSM. And finally, I got a call from uh, Dave Overton, who was a well-known personality. He was the uh, manager of the FM station and wanted me to come to work for him. And I'm, I'm thrilled. He's, uh, I didn't even ask him how much I'm going to make. I don't care how much I'm going to make. And uh, he, that, that's one of the things. He said, well, Keith, they, uh, do you want to know how much you're going to make? I said, I don't really care, Mr. Overton. And he said, uh, well, uh, when can you start? Uh, tomorrow. He said, well, don't you think you ought to give the folks at WHUB a couple of weeks' notice? Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I was ready to get on a bus and go that day. Uh, but it all got worked out, and we started there. And uh, I took jobs on the AM station as I could, did the all-night show, this, that, and the other, and then the opportunity came to, to go to the Opry, and, and I did. Can you share uh, just a few stories of, I don't know, some moments behind the Stage and well, the first time I was on the Opry, but people there are so welcoming. It, it, it truly was a family. And my first night, they pulled a little prank on me. To this day, I think Porter Wagner was behind this, but I'm not sure. But I was doing a Purina dog chow commercial before the curtain went up. And they all, all these stars gathered around me and barked like dogs. <laughs> And let me tell you something, Connie Smith does the best chihuahua you've ever heard. <laughs> I, I could have sworn there was a chihuahua in the background, but there was, but anyway. But that's kind of how, how my career started. But I, I shared so many great moments and got to know these people I'd grown up listening to, like Hank Snow and Porter Wagner, my, my very favorite, the man who just, uh, I, I just cherished his, his memory is Ernest Tubb. Ernest was so kind to me. And I, even before I did the opera, I did the Midnight Jamboree. Uh, first night I was on there, uh, you know, Ernest, if you're familiar with that, it's his theme song, which Walking the Floor Over You. He always ends the show with it. And he, he does a little Walking the Floor Over You. Then the band starts playing, and he, whoever the announcer is, says, get us out of here. Well, I just, I, okay, does he know my name? Does he know how to pronounce my name? Well, he gets to that part, and he said, get us out of here, Keith Bilbrey. And I just stand there and... <laughs> oh my God, he said my name. He did it just like he did with Grant Turner and Harold Ensley. And, and he looks at me like, is there a problem? <laughs> uh, oh, you've been listening to the Midnight Chamber. <laughs> but Ernest just taught me so much about public relations, how to, how to treat people. Uh, he was always very, he always had a top-notch band. And he, he issued uh, markers for them to sign autographs with. You, Ernest was a big believer in treating the fans right. And he impressed upon us, if you insult a fan, you didn't insult them, Ernest Tubb did. And we will talk about that. We will. And, <laughs> and how did you and Emmy Jo meet? Well, we've known each other a long time. Yeah. You want to tell the story? Well, well, we're going to come back with that because you two have an amazing story. And it has to do with this house, too. And we have more stories of the Grand Old Opry, and we're going to share about that in just a minute.